Okay, assalamu alaikum. Now we officially start because I think uh, many people are already here and if they want to join, I can add them later on, but let's commence and not delay it anymore. So assalamu alaikum. My name is Umama Sayyid. Um, many of you personally know me and if you don't know me, then I, uh, I'm a Finnish Pakistani woman and I work in social work sector. Uh, with an NGO, Amal RU, which works solely with uh, Muslim clients uh, living in Finland. It helps them uh, deal with social issues, any sort of issues that they have. So uh, I am actually a project worker with uh, Amal RU. My project's name is See Me. And this workshop I am conducting with my own project. It's about empowering Muslim women who are living in Finland. Um, basically, the, I'm, can everybody see my screen? I'm sharing my screen, so I hope everybody can see it. Uh, it's about, uh, this workshop is about enhancing your uh, communication skills, interpersonal skills and interpersonal and soft skills. They're the more or less same thing. So um, I hope everybody can hear me. The mic is turned off. If somebody wants to say something, they'll have to turn it on. Uh, just a minute. There's somebody who wanted to. Okay, let me unmute your mics and then just give me a second. I think the Zoom has. Are you able to switch on your mic? For me, yes. Yes. Okay, great, great. Uh, just a minute. I don't know what's wrong with this today. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Huda. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, are everyone uh, one here like uh, speaking English? They can understand what like uh, your project? Uh, can everybody understand me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. I'm unmuting everybody here. So you will have to mute yourself later on if you want to. Does this work for everybody now? Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I can hear you too. Great. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum. So, okay. I'm switching off the chat right now so that I can speak. Okay. okay. This is the program outline. This workshop is in collaboration with uh, Amal Ru. Uh, and Oma Polku project with Moni Heli. And they would be presenting shortly at the end of this workshop. So they're going to introduce what they do, uh, what they do themselves. But I would talk about my own project and this workshop specifically. Okay. So, so girls, uh, we start right now with uh, a lecture on communication skills at five o'clock, more or less. We have another lecture, which is how to improve our interpersonal skills. And we will get into more detail later on. Then at 5.30, we have Oma Polku. And at uh, 6, we have Intro to Amal Aru and Oma Hanke. Oma Hanke is another project. So let's begin. What are communication skills and how do they affect us in everyday lives? We hear about communication all the time. And if you've had a chance of reading books, listening to motivational speakers and um, talking generally, then uh, I mean, uh, you hear about communication and communication skills all the time. Um, put in some like basic words, communication is a process defined as a sharing of ideas, beliefs, messages, feelings, emotions, both verbally with our mouths and non-verbally with our actions using various sorts of mediums. Simple is just by conversing with another person. We communicate as human beings just by conversing with other people. And this is the first skill that we learn as a child. 
So this is the uh, first thing as a child and over the period of some time, we kind of get so used to it. We kind of take it for granted. As we grow older, we kind of either relax into it, like we don't uh, think much about how we're communicating because we're, we, we think we have the knack for it, you know. Or in another extreme case, uh, in another extreme case, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Mama, there is uh, someone who has the mic on, so it's quite disturbing. Yes. Uh, uh, let me say, uh, can you please turn your uh, mics off if somebody's mic is on or? Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. It's, it's much better now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, we kind of learn communication process from the beginning when we learn as a child. We start with our learning our mother languages and over the period of time, uh, we kind of, I was uh, stating the point that we kind of start taking this process for granted, you know, we kind of ease into it. We don't think much about it. And especially if we're with a close group of friends, if we're with people we already know, like our family and friends, then we are kind of like, we don't think much about it, you know, what we're trying to say. Um, we do, but not with, uh, with so much skill as we should, you know. And then, but uh, over, and the other extreme I was saying about communication process conversations is that either as we grow old, we get antisocial. We don't relax into it at all. And we find uh, starting conversations with uh, new people, with strangers, uh, with colleagues, very difficult. So if you're, if you're like, uh, excuse me, I'm admitting more people. So yes. If you're, uh, if you're that sort of person that it, it is difficult for you now to start communicating with others, this is a very good workshop for you because here we kind of revise all those skills that we have learned all our lives by now, but we kind of just put them in the back burner and don't think about them much. But um, because as we grow old, as we step into our practical lives after our educations, we start working and we, we are either like, we start our families, we meet a variety of people and you cannot ease into it or also be antisocial, you know, on another hand, we cannot be on either one of those extremes while communicating. So we really have to think about how we are getting our point across. So uh, especially for people who are in working lives or who are trying to integrate into a new society, like, uh, most of the immigrants here in Finland, then uh, we we should kind of revise our communication and interpersonal skills, like how we deal with people every day. It's very important because when we go to interviews, we should have this uh, aura of confidence with us, you know. And many a times we we kind of don't feel conf confident, especially if you're immigrants and we're trying to integrate into Finnish society because we don't speak their language. But in my opinion, and, and also in my ex experience, I don't think it's a uh, it's that much a problem because if uh, if the natives see that we are trying, even if we're tra uh, trying to speak broken Finnish, that's that's okay. We don't have to feel bad about it because our language skills does not equal to our professional skills. Uh, in some professions, it is important. Finnish is required. I would not deny the fact, but it should not mess up with our confidence levels. So. Uh, and, you know, like uh, if you have already been through what is a communication process, communication process, I would not go very deep into it. It's a five step process where uh, we kind of um, code a message uh, in case we are conversing, we code it in our brains, we think about what we're trying to say right now, uh, and we convey the message through our mouth, and the receiver receives the message via listening they decode the message in their brains again, and then they give us feedback. They say something back to us. And this is a very, very basic example of a communication process. Uh, I would not de uh, talk deeply about the communication process here because um, it's as simple as that. And this workshop is basically about do's and don'ts of communicating in, in practical lives. So welcome everybody. And if you have a question, please kindly like um, keep it for the end of this, uh, this particular one lecture. And then you can ask me, inshallah. And um, okay, let's go into like uh, how to define communi communication skills. 
Communication skills are simply how effectively we undertake the process of communication, like how effectively and e effectively and easily we are relaying our message. And if we are relaying a certain message, if uh, if the whole meaning is conveyed or not. Many a times, even uh, between two partners, between two very deep friends, between spouses, I'm taking these examples because these relations are very close to us. Sometimes you say something and you're like baffled because the message did not come across because we kind of uh, depend so much on the closeness of the relation that we don't put a lot of thought into conveying that message. We're like, okay, this, this, that, that, but the other person is baffled. So they're like, what, did you say this? Did you mean this? And then you have to repeat and you think about it. No, I meant in a certain way, you know, for example, getting things done in the house, everyday household chores. So, um, so basically good communication skills are how effectively, how positively you, you convey your message, whatever you, you were trying to say to the other person. So uh, uh, let's move on to the other slide. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to kind of be stating um, those points that we learn while we're in our professional lives in our colleges during our education. And our mothers also teach us these basic etiquettes and behaviors of communicating when we're young. But uh, let's revise them again. Uh, and uh, how can we remember to improve our communication skills? Always remember, like communication is like a two-way process. Uh, it does not, it's not a one-way process. Many a times we meet somebody after a long time and then we forget that the other person has a say in the whole conversation as well. And then we, we're kind of like, uh, you know, like taking over all of the talk, talk and conversations. It, it's all about me. It shouldn't be so. We should be able to realize like the other person, uh, should have a say in something, you know, or should be able to give their feedback back to us. So uh, the first thing is like, we speak what we want to say, but then we should wait to listen, get the feedback from the other person and uh, should not monopolize the conversation. So I feel like listening intently, uh, listening intensively is a good uh, and the basic rule of a good communication. So it's it because at the end of, uh, some meetings, some hangouts, you don't, you, you, you sometimes have a feeling like, oh my God, I kind of totally took over the whole meeting, you know, it shouldn't be so. So just a reminder that listening is uh, also a very important step of communicating because it's not always about uh, speaking. So when we're, when you're meeting new people, new colleagues, when you're in an environment where, you, where you're networking professionally, uh, you should always remember like one thing is like uh, keep your uh, body language positive, easy, confident. And then when the person is trying to say something to you and if you're a listening, active listener, then you should kind of like start like listen to something and give little bit of paraphrases, for example, uh, like say something back to them. Whatever has been uh, said so far, you make it into a summary and you say it back to them. That shows like you were listening and you're summarizing their points and that, that shows respect uh, in this process and that shows that you're interested in the conversation. It doesn't, if you're a very passive listener, that also does not mean that you're interested because I might as well have been waiting for the person to just get over whatever they were trying to say. No, but uh, you should paraphrase and mirror reflect what they're trying to say in little words, not the whole conversation, because that would just make it plain boring. Um, if, if, you're in a, uh, if you're in a formal uh, setup, if you're in a conference, if you're meeting new people, uh, it's, it's kind of good if you're standing in a group of people, you can tell relatable stories, but make them short. You know, Nobody wants to listen to a very long story with a very small point, and there should always be a point you know, like a more, the moral, moral of the story. Story, So it's kind of like um, listening, active listening, paraphrasing, and then if possible, not necessarily, because if you don't have anything like intelligent or wise to say, then it's not necessary that you have to uh, push a story in. 
but make it relatable and keep it short. Uh, short conversations, to the point conversations are always interesting. So, um, and uh, obviously everybody knows like the best uh, body language is confidence. So communicate with confidence. Uh, when you're speaking to other people, try to be clear. Uh, if you're talking about for example, if we don't speak the same language and both of us are speaking in a foreign language, for example, uh, English is not my mother tongue, but for example, if I need to communicate no. with somebody here, um, just a minute, sorry. Uh, so if we're trying to communicate with somebody in Finland, uh, English is also not their uh, uh, native language. So we have to keep the conversation clear you, we shouldn't use very big words because we understand that English is not anybody's native language, but it's just a common language we're trying to communicate with. And don't, um, confidence means like we shouldn't mumble. We shouldn't be like, hey, you know, like, hmm. and no, no, not that. It's very important that you, you keep uh, an easy body language, keep it open. Don't cross your hands, but we'll get deep into the body language part later on. Just meaning that keep an eye contact, uh, nod if you want to, lightly, and, um, and smile. Um, keep it clear. So, so yes, now we have a lot of don'ts here. And I'm sure we can all relate to these one way or the other. So, yes. Oh, yes, this is interesting. So just a minute. Hello. Yes, hello. Can, can you let someone in? Somebody is waiting. Let me see. Let me see just a minute. Thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody is in. Uh, everybody's in actually. Nobody's waiting. Oh, now, now I can. Yep. Thank you. So I, I can see the screen all the time, but right now I just couldn't see. So welcome everybody. So yes, the first rule, the first do not to do while communicate in the communicating process, communication process is uh, cut someone's conversation short. So this happens a lot actually. It's not something, uh, it's something we learn uh, while we're in like a uh, kindergarten and our mothers teach it the same thing in primary schools, but um, but it's like, uh, we kind of forget about it. And if we're very excited, if we're very emotional about a certain meeting, meeting with this friend or meeting somebody who's very close, we don't do it in formal settings, but it is very, very rude. And it's against the like rules, unofficial rules that we cut somebody's conversation short. So it's kind of like, it shows like you're really impatient and it shows like you're very emotional and it shows disrespect to the other person. So in, in this communication process, we have to make other feel um, respected, confident, and we don't have to make them con you know, question themselves. We don't want anybody to do the same thing to us because if I have to like question myself, was I that boring you know, while I was stating a point, I should have said something like that. And sometimes it's just outright rude. It's not your fault, but if somebody's cutting you short, and even if they say, excuse, excuse me, after they have said something, that's kind of like a big no-no, um, especially in a formal setting. Because in informal settings, although we shouldn't do these things, but we're, if you're in a clo with the close family friends, it's kind of like an understandable fact, you know. So because we're easy at that time, but uh, in formal settings, no, it's a big no. Uh, same goes for we shouldn't try to steal other people's conversation, and that's quite interesting. Like I said, like we can somehow more or less relate to these points. And how does somebody actually steal a conversation? I would feel like if I'm trying to say something, if I'm trying to make a joke, which somebody else has already heard of, if, if I'm trying to relate a story that has a point, which is not a story, but it's kind of like a made up story for the, you know, uh, related story, sorry. So, and somebody else knows that and they kind of like, and this is the tagline, you know, yeah, I've already heard it before. And I always find it rude in, in informal as well as in formal settings, because even if you've heard some story with a tagline or sorry, a joke with a tagline, story with a moral or a point, I mean, it doesn't, um, sorry to say, but it doesn't kill you to listen to it again 
and it doesn't make you the wiser if you have to um, you know say that you've already heard it before in front of a group of people uh, uh, so i feel like it's kind of really like a big no no if you have to uh, if you try to steal somebody's conversation you know and um, nowadays many a times many a times it has happened that uh, we lose focus and we take out our phone because it's something that's in our pocket that we habitually check we have to check uh, maybe twice every hour or once every 30 minutes or you know everybody has their thing like everybody has to check their notifications we're on so many applications we are on so many uh, social medias and we want to stay connected with our digital identity with our digital uh, contacts. Excuse me. All the time. So we kind of like we are present in the real world as well as in our virtual world, digital world. So I understand where that is coming from because it's an anxiety. You don't even feel like you have taken your phone out and you don't even feel like uh, you, you sometimes just don't realize it, but it's extremely rude. Like if somebody's talking to you, anybody, I would say anybody, even if it's your spouse, your partner, your friend, and you just take your phone out and you're like, you know, oh, sorry, you should kind of like make that excuse before because more or less like we're all mothers, we, most of us have families, you know, and if we, if there's something urgent, for example, for a person whose kid is in the daycare, whose uh, kid is in the school, and that might be urgent, that's understandable, but even then you have to be like, excuse me, I really have to get this, just give me five minutes, even if you are kind of cutting between the conversation, but then you try to remember what the other person was trying to say. Now, I try to keep uh, this to the minimum, so I switch the mobile off, so I keep it in front of me. So if there's a very necessary phone call or message, I can just see that, but I wouldn't try to like, you know, uh, break into a conversation. I try to do that and we should all do that. And I would ask any one of you, if you would like to say, tell me like, has it ever happened to you that you're talking to somebody and somebody just takes their mobile phone out and, you know, starts like uh, scrolling through social media? Hmm? So I, I, I would take that. Waiting for the answer? Yeah, yeah. So it, has it ever happened to you? Like if you're, if you're talking to somebody and somebody else takes the mobile phone uh, off? Frankly, uh, I don't remember. And maybe it never happened with me because, I, because this kind of reaction, it might lead like unrespectful way. And you might be like somehow, I don't know, but you might feel like a blowing and a respectful way so you would leave him and i think it's no uh, no never happened with me okay it has happened to me and i, I have personally done that uh, to other people as well so it's kind of like very common these days so and uh, when we're talking about um, uh, when we're having a conversation we have to be especially if we're living abroad if we're living into a new society and even if we're living in our home countries you know uh, we have to be culturally sensitive when what we're talking about. Uh, usually we have, every nation has these uh, racist jokes, you know, among themselves. But it, I, as, as time goes by, I feel it's very distasteful to, to, to laugh at such jokes because they're just plain old racist. And we, we cannot just do that anywhere, you know, we don't have to do that. Even it's about color of your skin, religion, if, it, if it's about accent, somebody's accent, I don't find that sort of humor funny. And, uh, and especially if we're living in a fo foreign society, we should just realize like the other person might be from a certain culture where that something might not be as well received as, uh, it is in some other cultures, for example, like we have to, uh, in communication process, in formal uh, conversations, we should just avoid politics and religion altogether, uh, uh, especially in work uh, workplaces, uh, because it's like everybody has their deep ideologies. You can never change somebody's mind and nobody can change yours. Uh, we can, we, I mean, it's always easy when we think about it. We always say like, it's kind of easy. We, we don't have to go into deep waters. We will keep it friendly, but it gets deeper. So altogether avoid the politics and religion. And um, 
I haven't personally uh, come across anybody in my experience, uh, in practical life at least, who would lose their temper, but some people might have some anger management issues and if they do and they know that they have it, then they should uh, try to you know, uh, control their tempers and never lose their tempers while communicating because not everybody is uh, close to you. Not everybody knows you uh, uh, that deep that uh, they would understand that you have some sort of issues and that it's okay to give you that sort of time or that, that kind of leverage, you know. So don't lose your temper while communicating. Even if you think that somebody does not ag agree to your point of view, it, it doesn't matter because everybody has like uh, everybody has a right to own their own point of views. We don't, we're not there to be uh, ideology police. So, you know, nobody would um, understand how you think like that. And I wouldn't personally feel if somebody's trying to like be very forceful about changing my uh, point of views, perspectives about life or certain anything. So last, uh, lastly, in this slide, we, we talk about, uh, don't try to lose focus. Uh, in this life, uh, in practical lives, uh, as we grow old, it's like we have a lot of responsibilities on our shoulders and we kind of like, um, it's kind of like we are we are multi multitasking. Mothers are multitasking. Everybody's multitasking. We cannot leave men out of it. So it's kind of like we are doing that, but we should try, we should make an effort not to try to lose that sort of, um, focus when somebody is trying to talk to us because what that does is like it makes the other person um, question themselves it's like uh, you know I, I sometimes feel like it happens if it happens to me I question myself I feel like was it like maybe you know I shouldn't have said that maybe next time I would take care even though it wasn't my fault but how would how would I know that and this is something that uh, the listener cannot bring it up to your attention like hey you're losing focus focus on me here you you can't just do that it happens it's kind of very subtle and it's a very passive thing to do but we should make an extra effort not to try to lose focus I mean when you're in the lecture <laughs> like maybe right now if that's too much information I'm speaking right now but I feel like it's kind of uh, difficult to keep focus all the time you kind of like drift away and then come back but if somebody's like actively talking to you and you're like your eyes just glaze over and then it's very obvious to see like you're you have lost focus and you're not there but it's kind of like um we should try to avoid that so and it's good to have hand gestures like when you're talking hand gestures show uh, your expression of speech it kind of like underlines what you're trying to say at that moment it's good to have hand gestures but uh but we should avoid making big hand gestures. For example, like, you know, some people, they go all the way beyond everybody's personal space. And you're like, they're like very sudden with their moments. They're very uh, big with their moments. We should avoid that because if people, especially in Finland, because there's this sense of personal space here, which is kind of like really an unwritten rule, but uh, it's kind of like, I, I respect that. And I feel also comfortable in that sort of personal space. But if you're making really large hand gestures, it's kind of like uh, it makes other people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, that's that's just simply put because it's kind of like uh, uh, they would have a feeling that you might hit them accidentally, you might hit their eyes, face, whatever. So yeah, body language is good. Small hand gestures are good, but try to avoid uh, uh, sudden movements and big moments. Uh, movement, sorry. So and if somebody's trying to talk to you, please uh, don't stay passive try to participate and uh, don't reply in, mm, yeah, happens. So don't reply in monosyllables. It's kind of, I would feel that it's rude. Uh, if you have to keep your answers short, just keep them short, but at least uh, respectfully like say something that would contribute to the conversation. Don't reply in, in a small yes, no, mm, yeah, no. Don't just reply or nod with your head, mm, you know, just uh, say something. So. And on the contrary to being passive, the other extreme is about don't uh, monopolize the whole conversation. And it happens. It happens, especially in these uh, peer groups when everybody should get a chance to talk about their 
issues, their problems, their experiences. So one person might just stand up and take over the whole conversation. And then because everybody should have the, uh, equal amount of time to share their point. And for somebody, it's already really difficult to come out of their shell and express themselves. So people who are actually kind of monopolizing this conversation are taking it away from those people. Uh, so I feel like uh, remaining passive and also taking over, they're both extremes and we should avoid that somewhere in the middle. We should avoid generalizations uh, because if we have an experience of a certain degree with one person, for example, if I, I'm a Pakistani, so I would feel comfortable if somebody's like, you know, all Pakistanis, they're like that. But what do I know? I just know one Pakistani, you know. I cannot generalize the whole nation based on one Pakistani. I cannot generalize the whole religion, which happens uh, these days. Uh, what you what you see in the media, like one person does something wrong and the whole religion, the whole community, the whole Muslim world has to take the blame for that. And I feel deeply disturbed by that. And I feel like that's not fair. And that's also, I kind of feel like it's not, uh, it, it doesn't show a lot of uh, intelligent uh, level for, or, you know, wisdom level on the other person's part. So we should avoid generalizations. We should avoid assumptions. We cannot assume what other people tend to do or what the other people like uh, want to say what they're thinking. We cannot do that. So we are avoiding assumptions as well. Yes, uh, and especially taking action after assuming something, you know, maybe that person doesn't feel comfortable in a certain way, you know, because I did that. It doesn't happen. Everybody has their own lives. Everybody's going through their own problems. We cannot assume things about them. We shouldn't in any setting, you know, lecture others. If you're somebody's mom, you can lecture your kid or, you know, if you're somebody's friend, if you think that somebody's about to make a mistake or somehow, we could have a talk with them, but in formal settings, in um, professional settings, in universities, in conferences, in networking places, we cannot just meet strangers and um, start um, lecturing others. You know, that's kind of like, uh, I mean, because we're there as equals, we're there as colleagues. Uh, nobody has given me the right to be dominant one and start lecturing. So unless you're on the stage and you have the mic, you don't, you don't get to lecture people. And sarcasm, yes, we should avoid sarcasm because not everybody understands it. And it happens so of, often that uh, we make a, we make, we try to make a point sarcastically and the other person takes it literally. So we, sh we should avoid sarcasm. And it has happened to me many a times. Also maybe certain cultures have a certain level of uh, sar sarcasm, which might not be understood by another culture and a person coming from another society or community. So just all together avoid it, try to make a literal point, you know, and um, sometimes it's also very comfortable not to crack jokes that, that you don't understand other person would take in a certain way. So lastly, about communication process, but not the least, you know, how our mothers used to say when we were growing up, like think before you speak, you know, and, um, as a child, I did not realize the importance of this thing, but now I feel like uh, thinking requires, like you just don't think, okay, these are the words and I say them as such, you know, you think about the consequences those words are gonna carry. You, in, a, in your way, you kind of think about where the conversation might go if you say a certain thing. So always like uh, think before you speak like if a certain point if a certain uh, phrase a certain you know feeling would come across as negative in a group of people then it's better not to not to you know no matter how much you want to say it but just it's better to avoid that sort of negativity around you so any questions regarding the communication process okay uh, just give me a Second, so I'm just gonna drink something.
Okay. Now we have this video link that uh, we can watch. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of like uh, rushing through everything because I didn't realize like it would take this long, but I'm just gonna, it's a very small four minute video so we could watch it. It's about the communication process. I thought it might be more interesting to see it right now. So there we go. think about our communication as a meal. What are the ingredients that we need to have present in the meal? How do we put together a great meal? Well, let's think about it this way. There are really five ingredients that have to be present all the time for great communication to be possible. All right, the first ingredient is clarity. How do you make your point clearly? It's gotta be clear. The second ingredient is brevity. How do you get to the point quickly? How do you not waste people's time? The third ingredient is context. How do you help people see how your point or how your message fits in for them? How does it make sense for them? The fourth ingredient is impact. How do you make it stand out? How do you make it memorable? And the fifth ingredient is value, which is fairly self-explanatory. How do you make your message valuable for the people who are consuming it? Five ingredients that will go into every communication meal. Clarity, brevity, context, impact, and value. Okay, great. So we've got our ingredients. Now the next question is, how much of each ingredient do we need? And just like cooking a great meal, that's going to depend Different meals are going to need different ingredients. They're going to need the ingredients in different proportions. And different audiences are going to have different palates. They're going to want different things out of their meal. So the really savvy communicator is going to look at their row of ingredients and is going to be able to determine, based on the audience that they're preparing their message for, what ingredients need to be dominant. So how do you figure it out? Well, when do we need clarity to be an important ingredient? Well, when there's a lot of complexity around the situation or around the issue, you need to make sure that your message includes plenty of clarity so people understand what this is really about. When do we need a bit of brevity? Well, when time is short, when we think attention spans are short, when your audience is gonna be very, very senior, you wanna make sure you have enough of the brevity ingredient. How about context? Well, maybe when there's unfamiliarity with the topic, or maybe when you're communicating with people that have a lot on their mind, or are walking in to listen to you, having just come from something very, very confusing, you probably wanna make sure you use plenty of the ingredient context. How about impact? When do we need to have a lot of impact in our messaging? Well, when there's a lot of noise, when we really need to work hard to make it memorable. Um, sorry, you couldn't watch the video. Can you unmute your mic and uh, tell me if everybody can could watch the video or not? I'm sorry. This no, is sorry. There was only voice. There we can only, only hear voice. it. No. It's okay, just here, but, uh, okay, but, Omar, but it's hearable, but the, the slide, I think it's not like a clear well, but it's like we hear it well. Okay, that's strange because I'm uh, screen sharing right now and sh it, you should be able to see it. But uh, yes, uh, thank Excuse you me? Marie, for letting me know. Yes. Uh, I think, Omama, you have to do like you have to open it in another window and then you can share it again. Then it works. Uh, but, usually but it, uh, it doesn't work usually in Zoom if you take it uh, from the link. Uh, okay. But, but, but I, I have very like clearly and then I got everything means only the visual was missing. Yeah. yeah. The audio okay. was clear I'm for so me. I'm so sorry yeah. for that. But no I, I thank you, Marine, for letting me know via chat because I was trying to like, yes, watch the video with everybody else. Okay. But, but 
i can share this video link right now like sorry i hope it doesn't start again i can i can share this video link on the chat and if you want to watch it please have a go at it later on because unfortunately i am kind of behind the schedule with my lectures and we have like one more interesting lecture coming on so i have just shared the link and that would be nice if you can watch it so yes is is that okay with everybody yes fine yeah yeah thank you for understanding and uh, okay yes interpersonal skills and soft skills they're interchangeably used and they can be uh, it 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 means like uh, how a person is communicating interacting with other people uh, how how you can relate to the other person you know um interpersonal skills are called people skills so it's called a pq like an iq uh, like a uh, a person has an in intelligence quotient we have like a pq like people skills so basically uh, the thing with uh, iq is like a person is born with a certain iq you know you cannot uh, increase your iq but with people like pq you can increase your pq by practicing so you can always work on your interpersonal or people skills yes so okay uh, a person uh, who has good interpersonal skills is said to speak in a way that people will listen yeah we kind of notice some sometimes like a person might walk into a room and uh, everybody takes that certain person seriously maybe it's the way they're carrying themselves sometimes we're trying to decode why a certain person has such a confident aura that everybody takes them seriously so i think that would uh, that would be because of a good uh, interpersonal skills it's the way it's a general package you know it's the way they speak to people they they keep their conversations in a way like it makes other people listen and they get the other people the other group of people would get something out of it a person with good interpersonal skills is able to decode other people's body languages so it's easy for su uh, such people to decode to read our body languages so uh we should watch out if there's some person out there and we're not completely uh you know in our own like uh sh shoes at a certain event then we should watch out maybe people can tell the difference if you're mentally present or not so and a person with a good pq is able to negotiate their terms if they want a pay raise if they want a certain thing from their boss if they want a certain favor from other people they're able to negotiate their terms very easily so it's it doesn't come difficult for them they're overall charismatic they're empathetic like uh, they 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 can relate to other people or they have such a good body language it it shows other people that they care uh, they're socially confident they're socially assertive so, so it seems like uh, being around strangers being around new people does not bother them people with good pq they are able to read face expressions and uh, are they they are the whole package they are generally more likable so if such a person is walking into a room so we can tell the difference like this person has a good pq okay so now we talk about um the three steps of uh, interpersonal skills the three buckets you can say the three aspects the factors it's it 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 includes verbal communication non verbal communication it's very easy when we say what is verbal communication it's all those words uh, those messages that we write those emails and uh, interviews you know negotiations all the things that we do verbally like communicating directly with somebody our verbal communication interpersonal skills and non verbal communication includes the body language um the facial expressions the voice intonation uh, those are the non verbal communications so sometimes you're trying to say something but the voice is like squeaky and it doesn't go with your point and it's kind of it uh, creates a very you know sus suspecting atmosphere like what were you trying to say you know because your voice intonation the up, up and lowering of your voice tone should go with your facial expressions and with your point that you're trying to come across and relationship management so uh relationships are like if easily we put it uh 
they're a two-way stream. So it's not only about giving and giving or taking and taking. It's about giving and taking process. So basically, we should be comfortable enough to set up our boundaries. When we're talking about relationship management and, and interpersonal skills, we should be able to say no. And on the contrary, we should be able to respond to other people's need as well. It does not mean necessarily, like, necessarily that if we're saying uh, no outrightly, that makes us somebody very strong with a good personality and we're so strong enough to stand up to our, uh, other people and say like, no. But it, it's like a two-way process. We should be there for other people, but not all the time. We should, we're not doormats, you know. We should have our own boundaries set up. So, Okay, so we have these certain, I have numbered these tips and I'll go through them uh, like um, quickly because then uh, we have another um, a lecture by Oma Polku. So, um, okay, so tips to improve verbal communication. Okay, so it's like, it should not be very difficult for you to go out and talk to strangers. Sometimes if we're very anxious, if we're sad, if we're depressed, we just go into our bubble and it's natural, it's normal. We have enough problems of our, of our own, but when we're in practical lives, we have to come out of that bubble and we should go out and start networking with people. We should uh, start with a warm up. For example, I would take an example of a conference of our even a party, for example, on a professional level, if we have these in Finland, like every workplace has a piku, piku yolu, you know, in December. So you're in an informal uh, setting, but nonetheless, there are your colleagues. So if there's some new people there, for example, if it was an Independence Day event yesterday and we were some present somebody where we have a bright chance of networking with new people in our profession, in our field. So we go to them, we, we warm up. We don't just go directly and start start with the deepest of conversations ever. We warm up. We're like, hi, uh, where are you coming from? You know, something nice and something light, not something very deep. And when we're trying to catch somebody somebody's attention in a group of people, we are kind of like, we should send friend signals. We shouldn't send four signals. Now, what are friend signals? Friend signals are, if you have a uh, an easygoing and open body language, for example, if uh, uh, and four signals on contrary is like if you have your, for example, if you look at my like, uh, if my arms are crossed, like, you know, like I'm closed in, my body language says like I'm already mentally closed in. Uh, I'm not comfortable to be there, to be present. I am trying to make an effort, but my body language is. So, and um, we should have direct eye contact and our hands should be visible. So. Okay, and uh, then we have this uh, opening line when you're when we are like uh, trying to open a conversation. It shouldn't be something very deep, something very like I always uh, point out when you're trying to catch somebody's attention and start a conversation. It should start with something very light, you know. So it shouldn't be like uh, you know, like uh, asking all ten questions, like how how are you, like where are you coming from, you know. Just something like you know, it's nice to be here today, you know, how do you find this lecture? How do you find this event? Something like that. And don't try too hard. People can tell the difference when you're trying very hard to, to make an impression, frankly speaking. And it, it comes off as a bit of a desperate, you know, thing like, don't try too hard. Okay, if you're trying to start a conversation, if the other person recipro reciprocates, then well and good. But if it, if he or she doesn't, then it's okay, you move on to the other person and start networking with them. Just don't, you know, um, try too hard. And um, okay, this is a cultural sensitive issue. I personally feel, I do not feel comfortable uh, in handshaking. But uh, uh, if like, for example, I'm a Muslim and it's a cultural thing, it's a religious thing, like I don't feel comfortable shaking hands with men. So I always go like, I always, in a respectful way, I always like, I already have my hands on my chest in a way like, you know, hey, hi, how are you? So the other person mentally knows, like I wouldn't just go with my face right into it and just, you know, because that makes other persons like they would shake, shake they would want to shake my hand. And then if I, it, it makes me embarrassed, 
I should already have my hands on my chest and, you know, not my head that yes. And it's very acceptable. I would say if you are in a situation where, sh where you're shaking hands, well and good. But if you don't want to, and you're embarrassed what the other person, the other person from another culture would think, it's nothing to be ashamed of because we Muslims are not the only people who do not like shaking hands. There are other cultures in the world where they just bow a little. In Indian culture, they do namaste. They don't shake hands. It's like a little bow and a namaste. So it's okay. It's it's about setting boundaries. You know, we don't we don't have to be in a way like we want to make an impression, but we don't have to uh, kill a part of us uh, if we are trying to you know uh, start a conversation. So. And then fourthly, when we're doing the uh, verbal communication, then we do the intro. Uh, we introduce ourselves. We ask the other person uh, what, the same question. For example, hi, my name's Omama and I'm coming from Amalaru and, you know, I'm a project worker. So where are you coming from? Uh, nice. Okay. And what's your name? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay. And what sort of work do you do? So basically, once you start the intro, the warm up, the opener, the handshake, or not such a handshake, and then uh, the intro, you might feel that the conversation is already all the way in, and then you might feel comfortable conversing with the other person. <laughs> Sorry, and then uh, I have to, yes, tips to improve the nonverbal communication, hand gestures. Uh, when we're uh, non-verbal communication includes uh, facial expressions, hand gestures, and what sort of uh, body language a leader has in a group. So I would start with hand gestures. When we are doing, uh, when we are trying to improve our non-verbal communication, we should uh, include our hands. Like maybe I have been trying to do that. If you can see it or not, while speaking, but we should integrate uh, hands into our conversation. Uh, I would feel, especially in a group of people who belong from different backgrounds, different languages, because if we only have one common language, which is not our Aydin Keli that we're speaking, uh, it, it, uh, sorry, mother tongue that we're speaking, it's very uh, easy for the other person to catch up to your conversation uh, if you're using hand gestures. It's easier to follow the conversation with your face express expressions as well as your words and your hands. And uh, what do hand gestures do is that they underline what we're trying to say. They, they put a bold italic into, uh, into an action of the words we're trying to say. If you're talking about numbers, for example, two, four, you should use fingers uh, if you're saying numbers, you know, as easily as you can um, until five or 10, you know, we have 10 fingers. So it's easy to point fingers with, uh, point numbers with your fingers. And if you're talking about something huge, something small, that also could be done with hand gestures very nicely. Uh, that kind of like emphasizes your conversation. And I think I personally feel it makes it more expressive and interesting. Uh, if you're trying to uh, express emotion, for example, if you're trying to say like if somebody, um, um, ex somebody's mic is on, so if they would uh, please uh, turn it off. Thank you. So if you're basically uh, trying to um, express any emotion of any sort, sadness, happiness, uh, you could just, uh, uh, for example, touch your, for example, like chest, you know, like, and, and obviously the face to go with it, for example, like, oh, so sorry to hear about that. Oh, yeah, you know, any sort of expression, if you touch your chest or upper region, it shows empathy. You cannot show empathy simply by your face expressions. That doesn't come very easily. Obviously, your face goes with what you're trying to say. We cannot pay our condolences to somebody with a smile on our face. You know, We have to respectfully make our face go with that. But if we have our hand gestures with us, if we are touching our you know, heart because it expresses emotion and it expresses that we, we feel right now for you. And um, yes, another cultural sensitive thing while uh, taking care of nonverbal communication is avoid pointing at others. Like when you're making a point, even casually don't do this because in many, many cultures, it's kind of like a, a rude to point directly. At, at least it's in, in Pakistani culture. So I don't know about Finnish much, but I feel like in, I would uh, take it just as a precaution that if, if the need be, if you, 
really want to use a hand gesture while pointing then just just you know maybe do this i personally would even avoid pointing with an open fist because it kind of puts somebody on the spotlight i don't i would personally uh, not like if somebody's putting me on the spotlight among you know others in a group of people so uh, i guess yes pointing is out and then body languages of leaders okay remember that person that we talked about would enter a room i really have to wrap it up because the next presentation has to start so i'm sorry if i'm really rushing it but the points are very clear and concise so i'm trying to like keep it to the point so okay remember the time when we were uh, talking about a person who enters a room and they have a certain charisma they have a certain aura that people take them seriously even though they they don't know them but because they carry themselves in a certain way so these are some basic four points that usually you know the leaders get the leaders the people with leadership qualities carry so although it smile when uh, when we talk about communication and uh, non verbal communication we always say that it's good to smile i personally feel it's good to smile but then again le in leadership language smiling all the time or smiling a lot means um, excuse me yes smiling a lot means uh, like a subservient uh, body language a subservient behavior like it means you are a people pleaser so we are not people pleasers we don't, nobody wants to be a people pleaser no matter how much we are but we don't want to accept that so it's good to smile or like keep your like lips upturned but not all the time uh, in in our order to you know not seem very desperate and um, hold eye contact okay what leaders do is if you meet somebody very serious in a ceo position or a very good position in a workplace so they would what they do is they do hold eye contact and they don't hold eye contact so in a way like if they're talking to you they would want to be taken seriously so they would uh, hold eye contact with you but if you're trying to say something they would not they would evade your eyes so it's kind of it seems like uh, it gives an impression that they're kind of like better than us and they have a lot of stuff to do and they're important and we are not so basically what we should do if we come across such people is like we should kind of just stop what we're trying to say and uh, we should wait for them to come back uh, and uh, and then gain their attention back so in certain cases um, you can also touch their elbows like hello is everything okay you know i was saying so but i feel like this uh, in finnish culture it's okay not to touch because that's a huge thing and i also personally would not want to touch or be touched by somebody even as casually as in a workplace like trying to catch me so you just stay quiet you wait for the other person to come back to you and make eye contact and then you continue because uh, we want to show like a person we want to show that we want to be heard as well you know so and uh, okay and you would notice like a leaders leadership skill like leaders hold uh, their body still they stand still they don't needlessly move around the room they like to observe people they like to read people in a room and if you're if you're in such an environment then also stop needlessly trying to roam around because that also shows a very people pleasing subservient body language it's not nobody's going to point it out to you because it's something like an underdone thing but it it comes off as a uh needy needy maybe a behavior like if you're needlessly moving around i mean i wouldn't you can go have your food you can network with people but just not unnecessarily and um last but not the least uh leaders do not nod their head while speaking uh they don't go this they don't go that like i said they keep their body movements to the minimal and they try to differentiate between the un vip people non vip people and vip people so i feel like this is the body language of leaders and how we can counter it you know so yes that's in a work environment and yes now we talk about the non verbal communication okay we are talking this is the third point of non verbal communication and it's decoding fa facial expressions so when we uh, when we are trying to like communicate we try we should we should be effectively sorry we should be effectively reading 
other people's facial expression, then it's very easy. It comes across easy because uh, we use certain muscles for each expression. And these are the six basic sort of uh, expressions that I have uh, gathered here. If we're, if we're disgusted by something, uh, even if our words are not matching, but our faces. So it means like, we're kind of like, you know, we're like crinkling our nose, wrinkling our nose, and we're like showing our upper teeth. So, you know, it's kind of like a very demeaning expression. So even if somebody is saying something else, but they show their like, you know, a disgusting face, you should be able to tell that in real, they don't feel um, that way, what they're trying to say, but in real, they're disgusted by a certain thing. So, you know, um, anger, anger is very easy. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, it's very easy to read because you get like these two frown lines and um, a hardened stiff lower lip. So it's kind of like, uh, this is sometimes we very uh, often notice among celebrities when they're being photographed and they're angry because they were being photographed. And usually their photographs are like this. You can tell that they don't, they're not happy about this publicity. Or if somebody's taking their kid's photograph, you can see their expressions that comes with like a frown. And uh, sadness usually comes with a little bit of frown in certain points there, your lips, somebody's lips might be quivering. If they're trying to say something or if they're saying something, their conversation would break and you feel that they're very emotionally involved in it. And the lips would be puffed up because they'll, you know, because we're trying to stop our tears here. And it's like the whole face kind of uh, goes with sadness. Happiness is also easy. And uh, happiness is like, um, obviously you have a smile, it's easy. And uh, when, when you're really happy, when somebody is really happy and their face goes with their deep feeling, they, their happiness, you know how they say the smiles are, uh, sorry, uh, the eyes show their smile. It means like the, your cheeks are involved, your cheek muscles, somebody's cheek muscles, they're involved. For example, if somebody says, you know, the smile did not reach their eyes, I don't know how they feel about it, whether they like my present or not. It's kind of like, because they just gave you a smile using the lower part, but you know, the upper part wasn't engaged. So uh, for fear, you know, our eyelids are open and we have a flight or fight response. Our eyebrows are like, they're kind of like up there, but they're straight that differentiates fear with surprise because if you're surprised, we're like, our eyebrows are like all the way up and our lower jaw is hanging. But with fear, like we're alert, you can see that. Um, I have two pets and frankly, I know if they're, if they're afraid at a certain point and that we're not talking about people here, but nonetheless, like I can feel that they're afraid right now of a certain thing, I don't know what, but you can also tell with animals and you know. And, um, Last but not least, we have contempt. Okay, this is interesting because nobody uh, would want to be contempted at, nobody would feel that other person should contempt them. So with contempt, you know, the other person is like this side smirk or like, like people use half side of their face, any half side, like either a raised eyebrow or, you know, or like this, this, side smile it kind of shows they're not putting all of their effort or emotions into it they're kind of being very kind of like they demeaning and you know they're being demeaning and disrespectful and showing contempt for a certain thing and then we have tips to improve relationship relationship management is the third uh, effect of um, uh, uh, you know our uh, interpersonal skills, sorry, I had to go back. <laughs> interpersonal skills. And this is really good, actually. The main topic of relationship uh, management is stop people pleasing. How many of us do that? Like we do it every every other time, you know, we, we kind of, sometimes we're brought up in a way that we please people. We kind of don't have any self-respect. We cannot say no, we cannot set up boundaries. We cannot just stand up for ourselves and it's very difficult for us it creates stressful situations anxieties and sometimes even depressions because you're so overbooked yeah that you cannot like you know uh, you cannot just say no to people and that makes your life difficult so such people people pleasers they need uh, they need internal validation rather than external validation they don't need any sort of validation or acceptance from outside they should just uh, they should they should just depend on themselves rather than other people to accept them. Uh, and it happens so these people don't feel any confidence if others do not 
uh, validate them. If uh, they don't make others happy in a certain demeaning way, that is demeaning for themselves. But what we should do is we should just depend on internal validation. We should be acceptable to our own selves rather than other people. And if we're saying about like the difficult thing about saying no is like if we're so used to saying yes, and I don't know how many of you said yes to me because they couldn't say no. I hope that wasn't the case, but if I, because I personally asked everybody. So if you kind of like, if you should start with saying small no's, you know, if you can't say no to something like huge, a big commitment, just say no to small things. And uh, just excuse me. Okay, so I had to check the chats as well. So, okay, and the best thing about uh, stop people, pleasing people is uh, that you have to give yourself time. If somebody is asking you to hang out with them, don't just say sure. Sure shouldn't be the first thing on your mind unless you're so sure that you don't have anything in your calendar if you're on vacation, if you have time and that you can happily be there. Just don't be, don't let sure be your first word if you, if somebody says that they want a certain favor from you or they want you or they need your help or they wanna hang out with you. Just the best thing, and I have learned it over the period of some time and I feel it's so mature and it's so practical and it's so relaxing because with me, what happens is I used to overbook myself. So my work calendar was one thing, my own, you know, like personal calendar was another thing, social calendar. And I would just forget. And I had uh, like two commitments at the same time. So what I would do now, right now is like, if somebody makes an, uh, makes an offer, I just say, let me get back to you in detail. And I get back to them. I, I It doesn't mean like I'm just intentionally taking time to say no, but I have to be sure if I really want to be there, if I can be there, if it doesn't mess up with my other schedule. And uh what you do is like sit down once every once in a while. Well, I wrote weekly here, but just sit down and reevaluate your life goals and for the week. And if you think you can achieve all your tasks, your chores, your goals for the week, then yeah, feel free to meet people, feel free to do stuff for other people. But if you if you're kind of like doing uh, like favors on the price of like on your own schedule, then I feel like it's it's a very good time to put it out of, you know, like, like just stop it, sorry. And yes, people pleasers, everybody who is a people pleaser here, well, I was uh, to some degrees uh, some time ago and I learned it the hard way, like I started saying no. So, okay, and get rid of toxic people. What toxic people do is like when we talked about about like relationship is a two-way street like it's about giving and taking no but you know what toxic people do around you is that they just take they don't give so they would be asking you favors all the time they would be like begging you in the guise of a friend or anybody you know or a colleague or whatever but they would never return the same thing to you or if you're not in a way like you don't need any sort of that sort of favor but nonetheless you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't keep such people around you because they're just going to suck you into their own own life and just use you like a tool. So nobody wants to be used like a tool. So just distance yourself gradually. Just, take, you know, take these toxic, toxic people out. Take this toxicity out of your life. And uh, yes, last but not the least. And I love this part of uh, interpersonal communication, this slide, because it's just so amazing and it's so relatable. Stop apologizing. If you're trying to say no to somebody, if you're setting up boundaries, for example, yes, um, X, Y, Z, I can't meet you this weekend because you know what? I have to take my daughter to this uh, practice and then I, I have to cook. You don't owe anybody any explanations. No, you can like, you don't have to explain yourself why you're saying no. If the situation arises, if you know, if there is like a big event where you had to be, but then you're making an excuse in the last time, that you couldn't be there, okay, then you can explain yourself just out of being nice. But uh, 
otherwise like just stop apologizing don't go on saying no you know like you know just don't go on saying oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i did i did that some people like had this and believe me i had this habit like i would not stop apologizing for no reason and sometimes my friends in university kind of try to help me out with that they're like just don't have to say that but because my i was like i was brought up in a way like i had to please people i had to make them happy and comfortable as comfortable but then i realized as i grew older like nobody was there to make me that comfortable you know everybody was there on for their own self so why should i be there to mother people out so stop apologizing you don't need anybody any you don't need to give anybody explanations and uh, well here we have the six tips to improve relationship management uh, so i think that is all for today and i learned everything from the scienceofpeople.com they have books they have courses and they have um, tutorials and if you really want to dig it into this because if you want to really work on your communication skills and go a little deeper because i just touched the basic points just go online and check scienceofpeople.com and they have these tests maybe they're paid that's not free or something but just do do those so it's kind of like really interesting so that's all for me right now, all from me. And I hope you are going to get something out of this workshop as much as I did. And I really enjoyed doing it with you guys. So, um, okay, is there somebody from uh, Oma Polku? Would you please speak up? Yes. Hi, everyone. This is Hello, Fiven. hi. Hi, Fiven. So yeah. I would, uh, I have given you the rights to share your screen. Do you want to share your screen or just speak up right now? I, th I think it's okay if I, I can speak up as well, but I want to ask, do you want to open for a discussion? If you want to, you can still like, if people want to ask a question and stuff or you don't have that in your- uh, Sorry, uh, I think that uh, Oma, Omama, if, we, if I'm in a start the presentation, her presentation, then I followed the same regard. And after we start having this open conversation, Okay. Okay. Yes. If uh, but if uh, because this is for Oma Polku, the other project that is happening right now. So if she wants a uh, uh, like open dialogue right now with all my other participants, maybe uh, people can um, uh, ask her questions because this is uh, everybody. This is very relevant as parents, uh, as immigrant parents living in Finland. Oma Polku is a very relevant project. So I would really want you to listen to what Oma Polku has to say right now. So, let's, uh, let's first, I'm going to start, uh, Omama, let's finish first our uh, presentation that telling regarding this Amal Aru, then we have this open conversation all shared. Okay, okay, uh, Fivan, maybe yes, uh, maybe uh, is it okay like we do uh, Amal before? What What you mean like to, uh, to a, a session of discussion or... Or what? No, no, just like a presentation tells about our uh, community, our organization briefly, not like in details. Ah, oh. Amina. Okay. Amina, would you want to continue? Because I had... Uh, yeah, Amina, I, had, uh, I was uh, thinking that we are in the end of the meeting. Yes. So I was uh, thinking the Oma Polku is now. And then yeah. after the Oma Polku, we will present our, our organization. But yeah. uh, you can decide what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. And I have given the rights uh, to you for the screen yeah. sharing. So you it could be very easy for you to screen your uh, share your own screen. So maybe right. we can start with even right now. Okay. Okay. Yes. Can you see? Yes, I can see. All right. Okay. It would be great if, sorry, if you present it in a play play mode, so it will be yes readable um, for us. Like in a uh, yeah slideshow. Play. slideshow, yeah. All right. There's a play button. Play button yes. on the right top. Yeah. Nope. All right. Yeah. Right. right side, right side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a play button. Okay, I'm I'm gonna but, uh, no yeah. problem. Yeah, if it I is difficult with it. Yeah, no worries. No, I will do that. No worries, we can like we can do this. Mm. Yeah. You can start even. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay.
So, so hi, hi everyone again, I'm Faven. So I'm gonna present uh, Moni Haley's Oma Polku project. Before going right into Oma Polku, I would like to say a little bit about uh, what this project is in, in detail. So it's like a two-year STEA funded project. It has three core activities. One is the peer support for immigrant parents, which I am going to do today with you as well. It's a peer support organized by native languages. For example, we have peer support in Dari, in English, in Kurdish, French, Somali, and Russian. In this project, uh, for example, we it can be carried out like in the form of individual or group and group activities and led by trained peer tutors. It focuses on parenting support, information sharing, counseling, discussion on Finnish education system and the various study options and what are the role of parents in this, uh, making sure that the kids have informed uh, make informed uninformed decision. And another aspect of this project is planning and piloting trainings for cultural sensitivity, which kind of relate to what we have been talking here today as well, uh, with study counselors together with our partners. So the planning of the training already started in 2020. It would be piloted in Usima region during the second year of operation. And again, the main targets are study counselors who are in OSIMA comprehensive schools. And then we have this cooperation forums, which kind of aims of which is to develop interaction and cooperation between immigrant parents, school and other stakeholders. So these forums bring together all these young people with an immigrant background and their parents, the peer tutors, study counselors and stakeholders and experts so that we have like a really working uh, system for the immigrant community. So as, as part of my role, uh, I usually discuss with parents about options for upper secondary education, the career choices and parental support, like I have said, and the objectives are really clear, understanding uh, we are working to help parents understand the different educational options youth have in Finland when they move from basic education to upper secondary education, and then learning uh, how one can support their child in their career choices, uh, which has got to do with um, with like discussing with parents how they enable their kids, not decide on their kids' behalf but let the kids know and let the kids be informed so that they make the right decision. And of course, another aspect of it is uh, providing information, current information about the effect of coronavirus on upper secondary education and again, career choices. Uh, Yes, how many of you are aware, maybe one person can answer for this, how many of you are aware of the school system in Finland? Would you like to say something? Um, I just know about the primary school because that's where my daughter goes, but I don't know much about the Finnish school system that much right now at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, and many of us know, uh, don't have a very clear idea of what it is. So one of the important aspects of this project is also we make sure that every parent are aware of the different, uh, the, the different stages at the same time. They are aware, they help their children go to the right, the right paths through this. So for example, we have kids in daycare and then there is this one year of uh, uh, pre, uh, preschool, SC Opetus. And then after that, the kids will go to primary school. So usually every child uh, should go, it's compulsory to go to uh, until primary school. So you, you're not really, you, you're not allowed to keep your child away from all this. But then after that, there is this optional one year 
where you can take a year off or you can just add other courses. And after the basic education, there are two options for children to continue their education. One is through high school, which is the Lucio, which we say. And then another one is the, uh, the vocational school. So both of them, the children stays for three years. Uh, but there is a big, uh, there is a difference between these two. So are you aware of those, for example? Do you guys know what is the difference with Lucio and uh, vocational centers? For example, uh, vocational centers are if we want to get into hand trades uh, and uh, Lucio is if we want to study further into the universities as like in higher education. Is that it? Like, yeah. yeah. Basically that's, but usually what happened is that both are the different kind of systems uh, that you go through uh, to, uh, to continue your education. So in the Lucio, once the kids have stayed for three years, they have to pass matriculation examination to join the university. And then in this vocational center, uh, the, there are like diff there is also one of the popular uh, paths in Finland actually for for career development. And in many in many uh, many African countries or in other countries, vocational uh, vocational schools are not that popular, so to say. But the the perspective in Finland is quite different. So it's like. This, this, the children are able to choose either to go to high school, study for three years and go to university, or they can still go to Amati Korkeakolu, that's a vocational center, and then they can continue their masters, their degrees and whatever in the Amati Korkeakolu, like in the vocation, no, what is it's it? It's like institutions. Yes. Yes, there. Uh, I was like looking for the English <laughs> English name between like changing that. But yes, so both are basically the different options that the children have to continue their education. So uh, another important aspect in this too is that once the kids uh, pass this articula um, articulation examination, they can study for bachelor or just continue until their master. So it would be from three years to five years. And again, with this vocational schools, after that they can directly go to study. And these vocational schools usually enable uh, uh, students to go to the workplace directly. And they are very popular. Is there any Finnish person here, for example, who can share with us what kind of uh, perspective is there in terms of this vocational school? Do we have someone with that knowledge here? Okay, so <laughs> maybe I shall say something. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I might need to say it in Finnish uh, if it gets uh, difficult, but uh, in Finland, vocational school is, as you said, very popular. Uh, and uh, me, myself, I have been in a vocational school. And then after that, I went to this uh, University of Applied Sciences and I take my bachelor degree there and now I am studying at the university also so you can take this road also so uh, the vocational school is um, you can start working straight when you are you have the degree from that vocational school or you can continue studying it's how you prefer it uh, and uh, from the uh, uh, Lukio uh, then you have to like decide that do you want to go to the university or made an application for the, also you can go to the, uh, this uh, University of Applied Sciences. Yes. So thank you so much, Mina. So that's exactly it. But in many of our immigrant backgrounds, these vocational schools have their own like uh, biases in our perspective. So it's with this Omapolku project, we want to bring to, immigrant attention also that these are the different choices that parents can make and they are equally enable your kids to go to, to have the right passes for their school. 
And what? And before this. Uh, sorry, my, my son is here. Uh, so for example, uh, one, one second. Sorry, <laughs> my son can't come here. So just to be here a, a little bit more. So another option for both Amate, Amate Korkia Koldo Lukio is there is also this open university which for example, if you're not able, if, you, if the kids are not able to decide what to do, they can take those courses from these open universities which enable them to apply to the subject matters that they want. So there are like really a lot of options for children here in Finland to pursue their passion, what they're good at and what they want to do. We have a question, sorry, uh, it's re relevant. So I would ask right now, what options are for one year courses before high school slash vocational school? Uh, what do you mean? We it's like you mean this is a training before go to university, yes. but this is an optional, I think, yes. oh, mama. Before My son go through that. Uh, I think it's an optional. Okay, yes, so it's uh, Hello, may I ask one question? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really keen, interested about the upper secondary. So like in my case, my kids are in English school. So what are the op options for them after, after this upper secondary school? Like when they will be out from the English school completing the ninth grade, then what would be happen? So, I've never come across that, that uh, like that challenge. Uh, but I would uh, still assume that this one year, because there mm -hmm. are these options of LUVA, mm -hmm. which are like pre preparatory training for high schools, it also stays for one year. Maybe the, it can fall onto that. So what, what is the reason for that preparatory? Because I know like if your child does not know Finnish and then if he start Finnish schooling, so he has a zero grade before starting the proper school, the preparatory classes to learn the Finnish, to acquire the level, to yeah. be in the pro normal school. So what 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 is this again? The preparatory school after ninth grade or I don't know, in between yeah, upper between, secondary to higher upper secondary. Yes, between like this uh, night after like this in uh, Paris Kolu, this one mm -hmm. year is optional is where they are they can be prepared to get like more for example more subjects or more uh, language skills or different kind of ways so depending on the kid and mm -hmm. usually counselors can can help in this way that they guide the kids to the right options for them so one one thing we do usually is that make that contact with your stu student counsel uh, study counselors regularly to see where your kid should go and you can get like the support in there as well. Uh, one more question uh, in the context of the counselor, provide the cons consolation for, for choosing your career. So I have been contacted with the teenagers mostly. So uh, what what is the baseline to recommend your child that what would be the uh, career, suitable career for you or the path? Because if I see in Finland, uh, if you are not good at any subject, so teacher usually ask you, oh, okay, you are not good at it, let's change it. Or if this level is too high for you, let's have in a comfortable zone. So I don't get the point that on what basis the counselor suggests you to have this path or that path. Yes, th that's really a very good question. And what we usually say is that the parents know their kids' skills, their, mm -hmm. their like, capacity. But of course, at the school, they also know how your kids are performing. So it should be a collaboration between a parent and the school counselor. And it, it shouldn't be like this, the final decision shouldn't come usually from the, the counselor. So you need to establish that kind of trust, that kind of discussion, 
and in helping your kid go through those processes. So uh, I, sorry, I would uh, I would like to like uh, just uh, want 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 to know for my like because now my our like at the moment our kids are in a primary school, but soon they will be in the same situation, and it's important for me to learn and understand the process. So the one point is this, like if you compare something teachers say or outsiders say like your counselor, your principal, whoever, and the parents, usually the ch child uh, picks the other one <laughs> rather than the parent because <laughs> you try to push. Like we are not with the Finnish background, like we are immigrant. So we have a different type of approach to, to have the things. So I personally like to challenge my kid but the counselor or the teacher in the normal Finnish school they said oh no no it's very high level okay if physics is too difficult for you don't go for it go for another subject so they don't promote the child or encourage the child to be in the some uh, uh, challenging position so yeah. this is the big difference I've observed I means yeah. it has been in my observation since like a couple of years yeah, yeah. Actually, it's not only your your own problem, your own observation. It's all. It could be also mine and how we brought up, for example. Uh, but what happened with the Finnish education is it's basically looks at the children' capacity, and at the same time work on those like passion that they have, which is completely how, for example, where I come from, it, it's completely contradict with that. So what we try to do is that as a parent, you know your kids and you know their abilities, but we don't really decide on behalf of our kids. We help them, we provide them information, we provide them support, but we try to give the children a chance to pursue their passion. But also they can direct their children even because sometimes a child cannot concentrate about his future or what he is going to do. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm with you. It depends about his capacity, about his uh, identity, about his ability. But I think the parents, the main key at yeah. home that they need to sit and talk about that this is an, the issue. This is the chance for you. The choices this is this is the main role uh, that we play between I... families and kids and the children, and then the child he decides he see what is his ability, the issues that he's able to do it. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, can I give you a one example that how the child is being facilitated uh, by the outer world? Like if a child is not good at Finnish language and he has at like an advanced uh, level. And then usually it happens like teacher is saying like, oh, this is very uh, high level for you. If you will be in the bit lower level, you will perform well and you will not feel demoted or you not feel uh, like um, as a loser. So instead of pushing child himself or he gets the point like, ah, oh, it is nice to be on easier level, then I will be excellent means I will be excellent on that and then I will be shining rather than having this level. But the, on contrary, life doesn't deal you in this way. But you can be as a facilitator for your child. Don't let others be a facilitator. Be you. I would just okay. say uh, what uh, okay. I, think, uh, I was just trying to say is that there is a certain type of stereotype attached to immigrants and their children and their futures. Uh, in the counseling, professional counseling, when you're in the school, because, sir, I, I've heard like I I'm, I haven't experienced it, but like uh, most of like maybe uh, some immigrant uh, communities, their kids are pushed towards being a bus driver or you know going into be a police. I don't. I'm not saying like it's a bad thing. But <laughs> Or yeah, yeah this is the options that they give. Preconceived. Why can't a child of an immigrant community all be said to, because everybody knows medicine is difficult. Everybody knows tech is difficult. Everybody knows difficult fields are difficult, but you really need to push the child. So even if the counselor sees like the child is not comfortable, I, I understand this uh, Finnish way of making the children uh, not very stressful regarding their workload. 
but I feel in certain ways they should be pushed harder, especially in career counseling, because frankly, when I was in like 11th or 12th grade, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. Like I was really waiting for my family to push me into certain direction because not but everybody this- is like here. And okay, this friend of mine might be a doctor right now who's speaking and she can push her kid at home, but not everybody does. You know, uh, if people are not even educated, they're not even periscolu, the parents. So I, I feel it's like kind of like really... Uh, unfair for the child yeah. to be it's even and- I sorry yeah. even I should be you pity. need to be I a guidance hmm. sometimes you uh, need to be a mama as a guidance for your child don't no, let but other be facilitator for but him sure. not pushing him not understanding that that way not pushing just sit and make a dialogue with him and just to open choices for him to open his capacity of thinking like, as if you are using the key tools for like drive not driving him but helping him at least helping him and yeah. don't leave us uh, as being as a facilitator to him and guiding to him no uh, be, would a, would a vegan- uh, I maybe if I'm really pushy, if, if I'm very ambitious regarding my child's career, I would do that. But not everybody can do it. If uh, a mother uh, has educated herself in her home country, I yeah, but she wants the I, best for her. But I have child can one, be impact with his family. Uh, in my uh, opinion, can be impact uh, with his family. Hold on, one one thing more important, like uh, like if being a means if I'm not a uh, educated mother, even I don't know. Uh, and I cannot envision the the better way, the future. And then child also gets always uh, encouragement to have the comfort zone. Then how he will be surviving into the real life? Uh, I, I uh, these are really really nice discussions that we are having. Uh, what we do at Oma Pulku is not like uh, we are not saying that let your uh, kid decide on themselves. We are saying that help them to make an informed decision. So there is a fine line between like pushing and then Mm -hmm. forming. Between guiding, yes, that's true. What we are encouraging here is that, for example, when a parent are empowered enough, when they have the right information, then they Mm -hmm. can help their kids to make that informed decision. So the kid is not pushed, the kid is not pursuing the parent's dream, but they are pursuing mm-hmm. their own dreams. So, and convincing, same time, discussion, and open their dialogue with them. And this discussion, it might lead for a settled, like, uh, convenient, uh, how we can say, abilities for him, not to let him stuck in one place and then say, oh, others are helping him. No way. He is a member of my family and he is my son. Of course, I need to be aware about him. Sit, let's sit and talk. And after being studied a year, that when he is unlucky, you start, oh, I don't know what to do. Okay, let's go bus driver. No, no. And he just like to be as frustrating in the, from other options that he is dreaming of. Yeah. yeah I, if you understand my point. But when you are supporting him, you are deciding. There- uh, I think this is like give him a, 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 a kind of future, kind of, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it's somehow kind of help. Don't leave him. Don't like just stuck on one place yeah. and leave him. We actually promote like really active participation of parents in their uh, immigrants, um, in the child uh, study paths. We don't have to leave them to decide by themselves yes. like have to help them in their homework we like that way when you are like every day being active with your child life then you know like their skills and you can even say no for those like for example if they are like you have guys have said if they are pushed into the direction that you feel like doesn't fit for your child i think in finland you can say no to anything so you can still say no and i can pursue this way or that way so that that cha- that, that chance that you have but like make sure that you're not really like trying to push that child into the dream that you want them to have so it's like, for example, in, in Ethiopia, every child literally <laughs> will be told like you have to be a doctor or you have to be a, a, an engineer and that's it for you. So everybody will like really labor a lot to pursue that 
parents dream so oh, here in but Finland, leave him he decided at the end you just give yeah. him opinions at yeah. the end you are just helping him like to be as a guy but not push him just let him at the end he decided i like to be engineering i like to be a striker i like to be any anything else but just you are giving him a choices you know as if you are beside him not adjusting him like a machine no no mm -hmm. just like talk i would like to cut in between because we have one more little presentation by amal so if we can just uh, you, you uh, know yeah amina will amina yes i have uh, keep to the yeah, if even can just finish with her you know yeah uh, yeah if you could just sorry hurry up i'm sorry yeah so this would be the final maybe so what we say usually is that parents can support their children in their career choices in many ways so get to know your strength your uh, the interest values of your child and map them out together with the child get to know the educational option and different jobs with your child so whenever you do, make sure that you involve your child in the process and give support in decision making, but do not make decision for them. Encourage the youth to find their own path because eventually that's what will make them happy. And keep in contact with the school and discuss continuation of studies and career choices with the school study counselor. So this kind of sum up what we have been saying all along now so thank you Fabian. thank you so much for this presentation and it was very informative at least for me because i did not know much more about more than this uh, peru skolu so thank you and uh, if if anybody has anything related with uh, education and uh, career counseling then we could always like go to open to polku pistefi and here are the links yes so Yes, feel free. I, I just leave it here so that if you want to take a picture, for example, you can you can have the, the links here. So they help you in that way. But thank you everybody for listening thank you. and having really a fruitful discussion as well. Thank you. So now uh, we have Amina. Yes. Yeah. Amina uh, is from Amal RU and uh, she's the director of all the activities. And uh, Hoda is also a project worker uh, who is uh, uh, working with Omahanke. So now they would be giving a little intro about the uh, AMAL activities and Omahanke. So please. I think uh, Amina would start. Amina, are you, you yes. can share the screen. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that I would like to, so uh, hello for everyone. One, I'm uh, Minna Taipale, I'm from the Amalaru, and I would like to show you one short video. It doesn't take only like uh, two to three minutes. Let's see. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't work, please tell me, <laughs> inshallah. Um... It works, uh, but I can't hear it. It works. You can't hear I can, it. I can't see it. Okay. I can see. Then, it. okay. Then maybe uh, we leave it because it it's just uh, about our work. So I can just uh, share the screen about our work. Wait a moment. Um. Okay, so I uh, hopefully everyone sees now this presentation. Yes, I'm. I can see it. So. Yeah, so uh, it's just a short one. Uh, and if you have some, some any questions, you can of course ask uh, during the the presentation or after the presentation. And uh, I will present a little bit about Amal Ru, and then uh, Hoda uh, will present uh, the Umma project. Uh, so, uh, firstly, uh, I would uh, tell that what, what is Amal Aru. So, Amal Aru is a social sector organization. Uh, it was founded uh, 2017, in the beginning of 2017, and uh, we do uh, religiously conscious community work. Uh, and 
we our purpose is to support and promote girls and women well-being according to Islamic values. So this means that um, our values are based on Islamic uh, background, but we are also very professional uh, in social sector work. So all of all of our workers and also our board members, uh, most of the board members are, are uh, experts in social work or social services. And it's very important that we give this kind of gu uh, guidance for the our clients. And why we were founding this, uh, founding this uh, Amalaru? Well, it was because um, actually me and the other founders of this organization, we were working on, on social services for a while. And uh, we saw that uh, many cases, because I was also working in this NGO with, which uh, works with immigrant ladies, but I saw that many ladies didn't get um, that kind of help that they would need uh, where the religion of their would be of part of their uh, well-being so because many many organizations in Finland in are very neutral about uh, religion which I understand of course uh, it's part of their work uh, to be uh, not to how you call it I don't even know it in English but still that they are not uh, linked to the religion so that's why we were thinking that we need this kind of work in Finland and we wanted to do it for the ladies and for the girls. So what is our mission? Uh, we want to empower women uh, and we want to strengthen the communality and also the sisterhood uh, uh, of the uh, ladies. Uh, and we want to also be the trustworthy professional and we are doing a lot of training now nowadays for the social services in the municipalities. They are asking uh, our help because they also in this um, governmental uh, uh, work they see that the services they see that many many people uh, have the religion and they want uh, to also notice this uh, religion in their work. So that's why we are giving now at the moment for the social services, uh, some uh, training for this issue. Um, what else? Uh, we, what, we offer guidance and also counseling uh, for Muslim girls and women and also to other people. Uh, mostly of course, because we are uh, meant for the women then we, we give a guide most of the guidance is for the women sometimes even the families can uh, call us or or some some uh, men call us and then we keep all of course the uh, counseling for them but uh, we don't like make appointments and uh, because it's not our work then we just find some other organization or some other services who can help them uh, so uh, we uh, give this uh, individual counseling, but also we have uh, peer support groups. This is, uh, that is the mainly, it was in the beginning of uh, Amal Arius, uh, starting uh, the peer support groups were the most important uh, activities in our work. Uh, now it's a little bit changing that we are doing more and more social counseling and also social work. Uh, we look, do lots of community work. We go to different communities and places uh, and give uh, give infos and meetings uh, do, and other groups, seminars and this kind of stuff uh, in other places. We have our own office at the Malmi in Helsinki. So if somebody wants to book a meeting, we can have a meeting there or some other place. It's very suitable for us workers to go also to other places because we do like this um, outreach uh, work also. Um, and uh, for the future, what we are planning to do uh, we want to organize more excursions and also we are planning to have a summer camp for Muslim mothers and their children 
at the summer 2021. So we are planning now and it will happen on Tuusula. If you know where the Tuusula is, it's quite near the Helsinki and Vantaa. Uh, so it's not so far away. Uh, and it will be maybe uh, about three whole days and uh, or four days uh, this uh, camp. So daughters can accompany their mothers as well? Yeah, and also I think uh, small boys, of course, not teenager boys, but uh, but small boys also, that's okay. Because we want to give also, uh, we are very professional, we want to do professional work, but we still think that these kind of activities are very important for, for uh, families and for the mothers also. So because... M- Many in many cases, these kind of activities are not uh, so often uh, given, like for the Muslim ladies at least. Of course, we have like these multicultural uh, parents uh, camps. That's that's true. They we have those ones, but still, uh, it has been a while when we had this kind of uh, Muslim mothers and their children camp. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also, as I said, we provide training and consultation to, to these service, service providers. And at the moment, we are doing a training for the social services. Um, I think this is very, very uh, short uh, info about Amalaru. If you want to ask something, maybe after uh, Hora has presented the Umma project, then you can ask some questions if we have time. Maybe Omama will tell us. But please, uh, I will put, yeah, yeah, for the yeah. board. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, hello, everybody. I'm Hoda uh, Rapapa, social working. I have worked about uh, one project, which is a violence against women. Okay, so we will just like shortly making a clarity uh, of OMA project. What is OMA project? Project OMA is a women a specific outreach project which aims to promote uh, the well-being, health, and participation of uh, foreign background and Muslim women of all ages. Of course, if you have question, you can ask after it, but I wish that the voice is clear because even I have something in my throat. <laughs> okay, Project OMA also aims uh, to relevant uh, harmful habits and uh, their effects on the lives of women and girls. Project OMA provides guidance uh, and support tailored to meet the needs of women and girls. Training community representative who role will be to provide her own uh, communities with information, guidance, and support in moving forward and changing uh, culture misconceptions. Uh, Project OMA will also provide training for professionals and other community members. Uh, we offer outreach cooperation, guidance, and counsel for services uh, for service user information and the training support groups. The project will utilize uh, a religion, a religious, I think, and culturally conscious approach of support to community uh, development and the participation of women. Project OMA is funded by the Ministry uh, of Economic Affairs and Employment of uh, Finland, Employment of Finland. I think that this is all about the, this OMA project. But about this, I will add more about what Amina said that uh, this uh, organization, Amal Aru, is based like on social support and uh, communication with different aspects of a human being by improving their skills and improving uh, them to be involved in their society and community and being acquired them knowledge and helping uh, uh, them like solving their uh, problem and define solution for uh, you know, at the end for any issue that it, it occurs. Mainly it's you know, our work is based on engaging, empowering women being as an active and fully of positivity. 
and also like help women not to be as a, just like a number, but a member, which it's like impact with uh, societies and not as an eclectic like objects in the community. But all uh, overall that uh, this like uh, based on communication with the older women and with dialogue and keeping like ties with the families that uh, go ahead with uh, all the issues that uh, reveal their aspects. Yeah, I think this is all what I have. But if you have any question, I'm ready. Is it like clear? I think my, maybe I have something in the voice. No, it's very clear. In my voice. Yeah. Uh, and please, uh, if you have any questions, please ask. And there is also our web page where you can find more information, of course, about Amalaru and also about UMA project and, of course, uh, CME project. Yes. Um, also, like uh, uh, what uh, in UMA project basically is uh, working right now with uh, Arabic speaking communities, Finnish speaking communities, and English speaking communities. So if somebody has some a friend or who needs help and guidance regarding any sort of issue that Hoda mentioned, so feel free to contact Hoda Yamina and Mina. And uh, for me, like a CME project, I also do guidance and counseling. So mine are like Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, French, and it's English. anybody. Uh, sorry, Omawa, is anybody is, is speaking Arabic in now like with participants? And um, is, is, does anybody no, have I like, don't. I think they'll use Arabic? I don't think so. Okay. Not right now. And also, I would like to maybe add uh, to this that also in UMA project, we have these community ambassadors, which are working in different communities. They, so there, there we have uh, also Arabic and Turkish and also Somali language. And then we have uh, English and uh, Swedish in those, uh, those uh, ambassadors. They, they are having those languages but of course we are training new ambassadors maybe next spring so we would like to have more uh, languages so if you are interested please contact me and we can discuss about uh, the training also so the the community ambassadors are because in this project as uh, Hoda told we are we are also uh, focusing on these harmful traditions what, which are affecting many ladies and girls in their communities. So that's why we, we want from the communities uh, to uh, their own uh, women to start like uh, telling and discussing about these issues. It's that we, we, I don't think I can go to, to any community and say that you can't do this. It's not, it's not the right approach. It has to come from the community to change. So that's why um, this is very important. You issue. talked about female circumcision, that how harmful it can be yeah. and how it should be avoided. So we do touch such uh, topics where you can uh, educate your own community uh, better if you train. And yes. And if as a Muslim community, if you want to convey some sort of like um, feedback message to the social services, the adult social services offer uh, office, you can always email Minna uh, because uh, they will be training the social workers very soon, maybe next month or coming year. Tomorrow, they are training so actually. <laughs> oh, tomorrow, actually. So it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's about telling, uh, making aware the social workers, Finnish social workers about the Muslim uh, community, cultural sensitivity and all the uh, all our like um, beliefs and traditions like yeah. Uh, yeah. little know how about that so when they're dealing with a muslim client they know more uh, they and know. also like uh, was relevant that we have our groups also that if they would like join or take a place because this is like it support them give opinions sharing uh, make a dialogue a discussion this is like a tools for them like to get skills and acquire knowledge and sharing with the community by by in, in, this is engaging them or involved even if like they know other they could support them and just like be as a guide for them for this organization i think that they would get the help yeah and i would sorry i i will add here that um, 
if you want to have appointment in different cases, because I wor work as a social worker in, in also in, in uh, municipalities, so I, I work in child welfare protection. So I also have this kind of knowledge. So, so if you have any issues concerning this one, you can always approach on those matters also. My, my phone number is also in our webpage, so you can, you can take it. Yeah. Feel free to contact and give your feedback. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Can I say one thing? Yes, sure. OK, sorry, before you finish, I, because it, that was very quick, I didn't mention about our Facebook page. If uh, they want to join any of our peer education session, we have Oma Pol Kuhanke Facebook page. So there you can find your own language and at the same time, any activity that you can take part. Thank, Thank you. you. And Steven, how, how long is this project going on? How long, how much years? Like uh, It will be for two years until 2020. 2022. 2022. Okay. Thank and you. do you have Arabic language also? Yes. yes. In your program. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, everybody, participants especially and the speakers, Thank you for taking your time out and um, being here for us. And uh, so we have so many services happening in the city, uh, which we're not aware of. So if you want any networking, feel free to contact us. And I hope you gained uh, good information uh, from us today. And I would, if you want, like I would uh, share the uh, PowerPoint slides with you right now. You can save the file from the chat before logging off. So if somebody wants to um, uh, save the communication part, just as like a handout, we can, you know, we can, we can, uh, I can share it with you and you can save it. So have a nice evening, ladies, and uh, let's stay in touch for some, for such good things. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>